Okay, so this is Joe. I'm back, and I'll try to wrap this up here at the end. Um, so Bob and Mark and Catherine have all kind of alluded to this nutrient management um, needs at the whole farm level. And so you have a schematic in front of you now that kind of at least one example of how that's defined where we have a farm boundary, we've got feed inputs, fertilizer inputs, and bedding and so forth. We've got nutrients that cycle within the, the farm going from the animal newer back to crops grown on the farm and then back to the animal again. And, and of the three arrows to the right, actually there's four, but of the three um, white arrows, uh, you know, we sell some cull cows and calves, so that's a minimal amount of nutrients that go off farm in that regard. The bulk of our nutrients that are leaving the farm is in grade A milk, and then some farms will sell some crops. To put this in perspective of phosphorus for today, um, about 20% of the phosphorus that the cow consumes goes into the milk carton, goes off farm, or goes off farm and then into a milk carton. And so we still have about 80% uh, of the phosphorus the animal consumes ends up um, in the manure. So Increasingly, if we're going to try to get this farm into some sort of balance uh, and not continue to build up phosphorus in our soils, we're going to have to look at, at uh, management strategies and technologies where we can uh, capture these nutrients, phosphorus being a, a critical one, and um, move those off farm. So that's a little bit of um, what I'm going to visit with in the next few minutes. Um, <clears throat> so where do we get all the phosphorus? Uh, that's, that's utilized in feeds and in fertilizers. And the slide that's before you uh, shows that the vast majority of the phosphorus, uh, phosphate rock reserves in the world are in Morocco and the Western Sahara. So you see places like the United States being 3%, China 6%. And so we have these uh, reserves uh, in locations which are very distant from the United States and probably have some uh, areas of some geopolitical concern. So um, I think it's important for us in uh, agriculture to understand this, that, that uh, we don't necessarily have control of all these uh, phosphate reserves. And um, there's um, some indication that, that it's not a um, renewable resource. And when it's all mined out, it's gone. So we need to be uh, beginning to adopt a uh, a mentality of trying to recapture this phosphorus that's coming out the other end of the animal and not used for um, into milk. So the next slide um, gets gets at that issue of phosphate production, and um, the estimates uh, that have been put out would suggest that um, maybe by the year 2040, which is uh, in my lifetime, I guess uh, I'll be retired, but still within my lifetime that we might hit that uh, peak of those phosphate reserves. And uh, um, so at that point, uh, it'll be uh, a dwindling supply. So again, uh, suggesting that we begin taking some serious looks at trying to capture this extra phosphorus that's there in the manure. Um, phosphate prices. Uh, you know, economics always creeps back in and, and brings us back to reality um, as it relates to animal agriculture on any business. And over the last uh, a few years, we've seen quite a bit of spikes. You can see here in about 2007, 2008, uh, the phosphate prices getting up as high as um, 350 to 400 dollars um, with uh, or a unit uh, relative unit basis 350 to 400, with um, price index uh, going back to 1982 at being that set at 100. I do know when I checked some prices this summer for um, phosphorus fertilizers or the phosphorus in fertilizers, it was push it, pushing as much as $1.57 a pound uh, equivalent basis. So it's beginning to be a, a very expensive nutrient. So I want to talk about some strategies, some technologies that are out there to capture phosphorus in manure. The slide you haven't presented right now looks like sand. Uh, the product is actually called Struvite. That's spelled S-T-R-U-V-I-T-E. And the coin to the left is a quarter, so it gives you an idea of the approximate size of this material. Um, and struvite is um, a combination of ammonia, um, phosphorus, and um, magnesium. And so the particular uh, 
technology I'm going to talk about forms this product, continues to make this um, struvite compound in a, in a crystalline, crystalline form. So there's a crystallization process occurs, and it's uh, fairly effective in removing this phosphorus from uh, livestock wastewater. This technology was originally developed to work with swine, and it worked very effectively and uh, very high efficiencies in swine manure. Um, our work to get it, that technology translated and, and, and used in the dairy industry is a bit been a bit more challenging because of the high calcium levels in um, dairy manure. Um, and you'll see a picture of this in a, in a moment, but the, the technology actually, actually is a fluidized bed uh, of the struvite and um, liquid manure after large solids are removed from it, then up flows through this bed, um, and the bed sits in a, a cone-shaped um, metal, um, metal cone. And um, at the beginning, uh, you boost the pH, or at the end, excuse me, you boost the pH with either ammonia or caustic soda, and then that continues to make the process work to capture uh, more and more of that phosphorus in, a, um, in the struvite form. Oftentimes then, we have to add some magnesium in if there is not enough um, magnesium available in the manure, um, and that can be either added as uh, magnesium chloride or, or magox plus carbon dioxide. So this picture um, shows a couple of these fluidized, uh, we're called fluidized beds in these uh, stainless steel cones. This particular picture is actually from a dairy in um, eastern Maryland, and I believe the, the farm is the Jones Dairy in Maryland. And uh, this system is currently treating about 60,000 gallons of manure a day. After the manure is treated, then it is um, stored in their lagoons for subsequent um, use for, for uh, cropping practices. The Jones Dairy, uh, obviously in a sensitive area there of the U.S., being close to the Chesapeake Bay and the need to remove more phosphorus from manure, and uh, they are getting about 70% removal from their, um, from their manure. Um, and this particular dairy um, is just using a standard manure management. Um, they, don't, they are not currently treating their manure with an anaerobic digester technology. The system that you see pictured here can work with both um, straight manure and the manure that's also been anaerobically treated. Um, so this is one technology we're beginning to see uh, adopted out there in, um, in the industry. Um, and this particular herd is about uh, 2,000 to 2,500 heads, so pretty good-sized herd. And um, so they decided they wanted to stay dairying in that area. And to do that, they were going to need to be capturing some of this phosphorus. So uh, one farm that's uh, come totally on board to that. Some other technologies that are out there, this is some work that was run uh, by Catherine Knowlton and colleagues there at Virginia Tech. They actually used um, some polymers um, initially to look at removing uh, phosphorus. Uh, so it's kind of a chemical um, approach. And um, you can see some charts here. Um, indicate as they go up in polymer dosage, they see an increase in P remo removal. And then you can see the cones here in the bottom that kind of give a visual uh, of that process occurring. Um, and what they found out was they could get a certain amount of removal with the polymer, but if they also added alum, they were also able to get an alum effect. So um, what they decided to do, and again, on the, the lower right, you can begin to see that at the top of those cones, uh, the material is becoming much more clear, and so uh, strong indication they're getting a really good removal of not only phosphorus but maybe some other nutrients as well. So what they did was combine those two strategies, and they, had that, they added the alum and the polymer together, and they were able to get up to as much as 90% uh, phosphorus removal. When they did these studies and um, took it beyond uh, just the laboratory scale but took it to a larger scale there at Virginia Tech, they were able to put this into practice um, and see that it at least was a break-even kind of approach to um, removing the phosphorus. So at least we've got a couple of technologies that are out there that could be adopted in the industry uh, and help with this challenge of uh, beginning to you know, get away from this buildup of phosphorus in soils. So I think in summary today for our whole uh, overall webcast, um, I think there's an opportunity there to use some current phosphorus availability estimates for ration balancing. 
as um, as Mark and Bob have indicated, the um, the numbers have changed for phosphorus availability. We're seeing a bit of a shift in the absolute numbers of uh, for the percent phosphorus in some of these feed stuffs. So it is important to to, to visit those occasionally and see what your phosphorus levels are. Um, and as we um, as we move forward, I think we're going to need to do what we can to minimize import of phosphorus and feedstuffs to the farm. But recognize that uh, we aren't going to uh, realistically be asking farms to just completely minimize or eliminate the use of these byproduct feeds because they are less expensive to feed. And so we've got to got to put a whole farm strategy together that's going to allow uh, to capture some of this excess phosphorus. And um, so I think that's. In conclusion, then, we, d we do need to think about feeding management, that it goes beyond just what comes in the front end of the cow, but we also got to consider how to manage what's coming out the other end of the animal, too, to keep uh, our animal agriculture system in, a, in some level of sustainability and to look at uh, recycling these nutrients that uh, are coming out the other end of the animal. 